Mars of Iowa. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Sarah. She does great work. Um, and not just in Iowa, too. I mean, this is, as we were talking earlier, this is, you know, this is the same growing zone here. So, um, but Sarah's been the research and policy director at Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, she finished her master's degree in agronomy and sustainable ag at Iowa State in 2008. Um, and she does have a farming background. She worked on farms in Ecuador, Vermont, Illinois, um, but is the first generation off the farm and into academia slash research. So, uh, but we're very pleased to have her here. She does a lot of work with cover crops and this is gonna be a great kind of, uh, no pun intended, practical application of cover crops. So. I hope I don't cough. That's okay. You can hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi. So, how many people have heard of Practical Farmers of Iowa before? How many of you are members? Okay, good. You can become members today. <laughs> so, I've got on these cool t shirts. Has anyone seen this t shirt, Don't Farm Make the Plant Cover Crops? Has anyone seen it? Oh, well, you can buy a t shirt too. <laughs> So I, I was thinking about this when I started working for Practical Farmers of Iowa in 2007, I was, or 2008, I was like, I'm gonna make cover crops sexy and people are gonna really start wanting to grow them again. And organic farmers had already been doing this for such a long time. Um, and sometimes we've gotten frustrated with rye and our rotation before corn because it can be a nightmare. Um, but a lot of conventional farmers are finally getting on board. So we, we got these t-shirts and Maybe I'm kind of loud here, let me turn this down. Um, we got these t-shirts made, and you'll see there is a nice stand of cover crops, pass this around, and it's rye, and what's the legume in there is hairy vetch, which is a common cover crop that we grow in Iowa, which is a lot of where I work in. Um, I'm gonna pass around a bunch of different stuff. Maybe I'll wait on this a second, okay. So anyways, I was going to talk today about what Practical Farmers is about, what we do, and what we do with cover crops. And to the nitrogen question that you brought up, my first response besides some carbon and nitrogen ratio discussion is do on-farm research. You should be putting out check strips with nothing or with reduced amounts of nitrogen following anything you try on your farm. How many folks are doing on-farm research? How many folks are doing at least demonstrations, like you're a being observant, you're writing things down, right? You need to do randomized replicated strips on your farm, and that could mean just three replications. But you really need to check things out because on your farm it's going to work completely different than on anyone else's farm. And we totally forget about this. This organic farmer from where I'm from in Illinois said, I put on this spray on my organic beans, and I think it's going to, you know, some growth, uh, something that's accepted, thank you, that's okay with. Uh, with the, the NLP, and you know, I think I got all this great yield. I got 50 bushels per acre of yield. And I was like, well, did you do any strips without it? What if you just wasted a bunch of money? He's like, no, and I was like, well, you have to do that. So I have a picture up here of Paul Muggy. Does anyone know Paul? He's, okay, some of you do. Paul is like the master researcher of Practical Farmers of Iowa. He's done tons of on-farm research. He's an organic farmer from near Cherokee, Iowa. Um, he's also an aerospace engineer, so he's not, not only a farmer, but he's a rocket scientist. <laughs> so he likes to really try things out on his farm, but that helps him tweak his system. And you know, the university doesn't know what we're doing on our farms, so we need to answer those questions ourselves, which is what Practical Farmers is based on. So I'm gonna talk about who we are, this idea of growing more than crops, which a lot of you already know this idea, and then some of our on-farm research. Uh, results with cover crops, and then I have our aphid resistance soybean trial. I don't know, you can tell me to shut up when you want to. And just an ask questions, okay? Let's have a discussion. Um, so our mission at PFI is to research, develop, and promote. So we're not just trying to sit around and talk about a bunch of stuff, but we also want to make sure that we research things and then share that information. I think I just turned myself down, maybe. I'm a pretty loud talker normally. <laughs> then that. you just turned me off. Okay, um, but the goal is that the research is profitable first of all, right? So are we reducing inputs but not sacrificing output, product? And then is it ecologically sound? So when we reduce nitrogen, if we're putting on synthetic fertilizer, or when we uh, go to an aphid resistant soybean, um, is that better because then we don't have to spray anything? So are we ecologically sound? And then community enhancing, kind of 
not necessarily getting back to grandpa's farm, but just maybe repopulating rural Iowa or rural Minnesota because there's more people, there's more jobs because there needs to be more people. Okay, so who is PFI? These guys are PFI. How many people have ever attended a practical farmer's field day? How many people have go to field days though in general? Okay, you need to go to field days because that's where you can learn the most, okay? So people sitting around, our field days maybe are a little different than other groups, so we have the farmers present. I don't usually present. I tried to actually get out of this and have a farmer come and present instead of me, but they twisted my arm. Um, so we really think farmers learn the best from farmers and anything that I'm really invoking all of our 1,500 members today anyway. So the organization is groups of uh, farmers. They're growing on two acres to 2,000 acres. They're selling to farmers markets or direct markets or in the commodity market, and that can be commodity organic or commodity conventional. <clears throat> They're producing conventional, natural, and organic. So it's really great when we can get a set of farmers together who grow vegetables, who grow GMO traded Monsanto, and who grow you know, Great Harvest Organics or Albert Lee Seedhouse Viking. And they're all talking about maybe soil organic matter. It's a really great opportunity for learning and sharing. And then they grow different things like grains, meats, <laughs> dairy, vegetables, and fruits. You okay? Okay. And then just an example of the organization, I don't know if you know who our Secretary Bag is in Iowa, but he, his name is Bill Norton, and he's a conventional ridge tiller from Northern Iowa. He's a member of PFI. Francis Tickey is an organic uh, grass-based dairy farmer from Southeast Iowa. And Denise O'Brien, and these two people ran against Bill in the last couple of elections. De Denise is a vegetable farmer in Iowa, and then Dick is our founder, and he's an organic, low-input uh, row cropper from Central Iowa. So those types of people belong to this organization, and I all encourage you to come learn about PFI. Um, you don't have something exactly the same in, in Minnesota, but uh, we're not that far away. So the, the goal here is really, and the idea here is that we're a big tent. Lots of people get together and talk, lots of farmers get together and talk about the different things they're trying on their farm. <coughs> this is a breakdown of the members, so three quarters of our members are farmers, and then 28% are friends of farmers, like Mac, or Everly Seahouse would be a friend of farmer. Uh, we have a growing membership. I don't have the, this year's uh, new members in there, but over, the t over time, our new membership has been growing. And our farmers really tell us what to do. So this is Dan Wilson. He's from Northwest Iowa also. And he's on our board of directors, and he says, I want to know more about grass-based, I want to know about, more about grazing, about doing grass-based dairy, um, and I want to improve uh, feeding pigs, alternative feeds, uh, not just corn and soybeans. And so that's what we work on, because they tell us to. These are our different program areas, so if you're looking to talk to somebody, maybe in the office, or get connected with a farmer who might be doing something that you want to try, we have field crops. I'm the person who works with the field crop farmers, and I also work on policy at the bottom. Uh, and then we pork crops, meat, pork, grazing systems, poultry, uh, and then we have a big group of beginning farmers in our network. How many folks are thinking that they have a beginning farmer or they are a beginning farmer who might transition their farm one day? How many people are looking for a beginning farmer to help maybe transition, transition their farm? Well, if you want help with that or you want to figure out those tough discussions that folks need to start having uh, so that if we want to transition farm that we've put a lot of effort into, especially if it's organic, uh, PFI has been working on that. We have a set of older farmers in our network who have said, okay, this is what we're going to do to make sure that all that soil organic matter I just invested doesn't get, it doesn't have a hydro supply to it when our farm gets maybe transitioned out of our family. So what are the steps in, that I need to put in place to have a beginner take over? And then we do a little bit on policy work. <coughs> Okay, so just some testimonials why farmers belong to PFI. Uh, this is uh, son and his dad, the Sawyers, they're over on the Mississippi River. They're transitioning, I don't know if you can see the row crop in the back, they're transitioning that to grass and they're doing mob grazing. And they learned about that through PFI. Neil was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala, came back to the farm, started farming, and they said, let's bring the cattle into the farming business more and let's transition out of uh, row crops and do grass-based systems. Uh, this is a picture of Ron Roseman here at his field day last year. He's one of our founding members. Has anyone attended a Roseman field day? 
Well, if you get a chance to in the future, you should go out there. Ron's done a ton of research. He's down in Western Iowa. Uh, this is a picture in front of his aphid resistant and non-resistant uh, uh, soybean trial that he did last year. And then just by belonging to the organization, so what we want to see here is an increase in the lighter purple and the, this mid-purple and a decrease in that. So just by belonging to PFI, the farmers and organizations say that we are helping them improve their efficiency. We see that from 2011 to 12, a greater increase in that light purple and then the medium purple. That farmers said just by belonging to the organization, their farm profitability has improved. And again, increases in the light green and that medium green, and then their stewardship. And so it increases in the light blue and the medium blue. So just Voluntarily joining the organization, getting our newsletter, having the discussions with other farmers. Farmers and organizations say, yeah, I can say because I went to PFI events or was part of the organization, I learned something that saved me time, which saved me money, which made my farm more profitable. Yes? So he's also that guy in the aphid study, is that on the computer someplace? Or do you have to be a member to get to it? All our stuff is free, and I, but we would love for you to become a member. I have actually a handout of the ancient study right here. You do not have to live in Iowa. We have lots of members who are not from Iowa, but the majority are Iowans. Here is the APHIS study from this last year. And then here's another one. So we did this two years in a row. <coughs> So the farmers get together in February and say, you know, I want to try these aphid resistant soybeans that I've heard so much about. And we have funds to offset the cost for them to do, that's the study the year before, uh, to do some of these things. Or, you know, we might ask a Blue River hybrids to donate some bags of seed so the farmers can try them. Question. Oh, yes. Why do some organic farms have aphids and some other farms that are not organic? Okay. Without spring. So in a high aphid year, neighboring farms have different amounts of aphids? Or none. So they might have buckthorn. I mean, they might have different habitats where the aphids hang out in higher you know, percentage than others. Um, so like Paul, for example, in Northwest Iowa is in a really hot aphid zone for whatever reason. He always has high aphid pressure, which is why he's not producing the I, I something or another's red one, uh, so he can sell those. But farmers to the east of him don't have as high aphid pressure. It must just be location. I don't, I don't know the answer, whether there would be more aphids or less aphids. But for organics, you can't spray anything that really works. So, or, so <laughs> aphid resistant beans is a really good tool. Yeah. There is natural biological going on in there too, possibly, that person would have to check out in that field from natural funguses and diseases mm -hmm. to actual other insects that might be combating as well. I ran into that in one of my fields a couple years ago. Differences in aphid pressure, yep. field to field, yeah. because of soil fungi. I actually had um, the ladybugs are pretty, helping me pretty well, along with some spiders and other things. <coughs> and the population did spike a little bit. I had a fungus that came in. Now though, any aphid population that works there. Hmm. So it, it, it all, based on temperature and rain, and that's the other thing, heavy rain event on a soft body or anything like an aphid will devastate them too. Yeah. So you got pockets of rainstorms and other things going around. Yeah, I rain will not come There's reasons for some of it as well. There's, that, geez, it's a, there's so many things that could be. So maybe I should just go right to the aphid study really quick. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'll come back to cover crops. I can talk about any of these things. Okay, so the farmer set up randomized replicated strips. Does everybody kind of understand what that is? Let me just explain it, okay? Treatment one and two, and then again one and two, and then maybe two and one across the field. And they're the, the size of a planter or the size of your combine. And, and you plant the length of the field, so 500 feet or more, and then you get a way wagon or a really good calibrated yield monitor and take the yield off of each strip. Don't bulk the, 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 the seeds. This is the biggest problem we have. Don't bulk the result. Give the individual yield, and then we'll run statistical analysis, okay? Because we have to see the field variability, okay? So for that study, which some of you have here, 
And this is the 2010 study, so I think only actually you got the 2010 study right now. Um, New Hampton, Prengar Sutherland, and Harland are all organic only. Winfield is conventional, and so he was able to include the Roundup Ready uh, tra uh, traded soybean also in the study. So this is what was tested. Uh, with and without aphid resistance, with and without aphid resistance, and then these are food grade, and these are feed grade. And this is in 2010. So unfortunately, in the two years we did this was after a really high aphid pressure year. Then the next two years, we had low aphid pressure. So this really is just showing the performance of the beans. Because there isn't much, there aren't many aphids out there to cause the So in, um, in 2010 at Harlan, the stars mean that there was a statistical difference in the yields between the hybrids. And remember, this, this uh, bar is the average of three or four replicated plots. Okay, so it's not just one plot, this is several, across these five locations. Blue is the aphid resistant bean, red is the susceptible, higher yielding potentially, or, or more common bean. And as we see at three of the five locations, the aphid resistant bean did not yield as much as the susceptible bean when there were no aphids present. And this was in 2010, okay? Now, as genetics have come along, maybe we are seeing differences in that. At Primgar, though, they yielded the same. And at Winfield, actually, the aphid resistant bean out yielded the, the uh, not the GMO bean in this case, okay? And, and this field was managed as a non-GMO field, okay? Because one bean was GMO and one bean was non-GMO. And then in 2011, we did the study again. Different, some of the locations are different. Harlan is the same, Sioux Center is Dort College. Stanton is Southwest Iowa, and Sutherland is Paul's Farm again. Again, with and without aphid resistance, with and without aphid resistance, and, the, and then we had a set of folks who had the ability to do uh, Roundup Ready beans and non-Roundup Ready beans, because two of these locations are organic and two are conventional. So you, can you see that there? <clears throat> this is the study you should have in your hand. Okay, so different letters, letters, similar letters mean the same yield statistically, different letters mean different yield statistically. The blue are the aphid resistant beans, and the orange are the susceptible beans. So in Sioux Center, which is Dort, under, and they have high aphid pressure in 2011, and I'll show that next. No yield difference, because the letters are the same. No yield difference in soybeans, whether they were susceptible or not susceptible. And these, this was the no for cane roundup readies. And then Stanton dramatically <clears throat> reduced aphid resistant yield compared to the susceptible, but this is a comparison of GMO and non-GMO also. And then Sutherland, slight increase in aphid resistant yield uh, compared to susceptible, and this is under aphid pressure on organic, meaning no spray. So under high population, because Paul had high aphid pressure in 2011, under high aphid pressure, the aphid resistant bean did out yield the susceptible. And then in Harland, under no aphid pressure, similarly yields. So this tells me maybe, <clears throat> and Avril Seedhouse could maybe explain this, in 2011 maybe there was a better yielding bean that the RAG1 gene was bred into. Thoughts? Well, we certainly are seeing improvements there. I don't know, I think, I wonder if you not, didn't have the same two that year. On the, on the conventional side, it would have been Iowa 3027. Right, so like at Harlan, for example, it was, uh, yeah, a 2.9 and a 2.7. So maybe those are different enough. So the yield wasn't different. This has the rag one and this doesn't. Oh, maybe the 2.9 and the 2.7 is the, the, so the 2.9 is later, right. and it yielded the same the aphid resistance and the susceptible. But at Sutherland, they are exactly the same, and this out yielded this, right. under, under aphid pressure. And I think, I mean, just from talking to, and I know there's folks in the room that have grown aphid tolerant beans, and I think our experience with them is that, uncertainly in an environment where there is aphid pressure, the aphid tolerant beans have yielded more. Uh, it's been, I think, a little disappointing that the aphid seems to develop the ability to feed on the aphid tolerant beans as the season goes along. So Matt, I think you and Neely went out in the field and, uh, <coughs> Two years ago, went out in a field in um, western Minnesota, and there was like no aphids in the aphid tolerant beans, right? Mm -hmm. But then, as the season goes along, the aphids start to be able to feed on them, mm -hmm. and so it's been a little disappointing that it, it seems like they can do that. However, 
And that result is uh, more yield. We get more yield out of the basic pollen seed. And I don't know if you're going to talk about the fact that we now are seeing uh, two aphid resistance genes stacked in the same soybean. Uh, RAG1 and RAG2 are going to be in the same soybean uh, coming out of Iowa State this year, actually. Yeah, so we didn't have folks that wanted to do research in 2012, and the RAG1 and 2 loaded bean is not ready until next year. Um, so maybe folks will want to do research on that. But then just to go, so this is at, the, at Dort, which had the Northrop King <clears throat> uh, GMO beans with and without aphid resistance. They sprayed half the plot and then didn't spray half those plots, okay? So when aphids uh, population started to take off in first week of August, they applied insecticides with their conventional so they can do that. So this really shows the performance of the bean against an insecticide treated susceptible bean. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we have the four combinations. This is a full factorial. So this is no spray and the most and the susceptible bean. Okay? Susceptible known as insecticide in, in insecticide, I can't talk. And this is number of aphids per plant. So this is what was in the field, okay? So we got up to over 300 aphids per plant, and you know the recommendation is to spray for conventional at 250, um, although most farmers get anxious and spray whenever they want to. So susceptible no insecticide, insus insecticide is the highest. Okay, and then these are not statistically different, and this is the combination of aphid resistance, so just the beans natural resistant with no insecticide, is this line. Aphid resistant bean with insecticide is this line. And then susceptible bean with insecticide. So we can see that the, the aphid resistant no insecticide is as good of a control on aphids per plant as a susceptible bean with a chemical spray. So that should give peace to an organic farmer who can't spray an insecticide. Does that make sense? Okay. Now you need aphids though, right? I mean, <laughs> in some cases. Okay, so then we looked at the yield of those combinations. Okay, so and this is again just a door. So we have aphid resistant and susceptible versus no insecticide and insecticide. And letters that are similar mean uh, yields are, are the same statistically. But you can, you can take your own conclusion from this. So 66 bushels is on the insecticide treated susceptible bean, which you know would be that high yielding Northrop King bean uh, that probably a lot of farmers were planting, compared to the aphid resistant at 64 with insecticide or 63. So about three bushels difference, although not statistical, it is three bushels difference. If you had a lot of aphids and you couldn't apply an insecticide, but you had the aphid resistant bean compared to if you had your susceptible bean and you sprayed an insecticide. Does that make sense? So organic farmers may be giving up three bushels, but maybe that's good insurance. Because you could give up a lot more, right? I mean, if it can really take out those organic beans. So that kind of research is great, you know, because you can't do this on an organic farm. You can't spray an insecticide to get a, a, a test, you know, to see what your yield potentially might be. Is there questions on that? Okay, so in 2013, if anybody wants to sign up, you can. Okay, so I'll go back and talk about cover crops. I have one question. Yeah. Are you right? What? What maturity varieties are you available? For the aphid resistant beans? What was the question? What maturities are available for the AR beans? So for, for our beans, at least, um, we have a 1-5, that's aphid resistant. Uh, and that's a, that's a feed grade type soybean, so dark hyalum, uh, true feed type bean. Um, we have a 1-9 feed grade soybean. Um, you know, again, a feed grade soybean, and then we have a Two six, uh, the, the one that was in the study is the, eight, the Iowa thirty point seven. That's a that's a food type soybean, so clear high one uh, with the rag one gene. And we have, we will be getting the rag one and rag two stack soybean on that particular variety next year. Hopefully. Well, we have some feed stock, but that's all we've got. That's the plan. Can you tell us the numbers? Oh, the numbers. Uh, the, the 1.5 is Viking uh, 1544 AT. As, uh, a seed, as a seed grower in the room, you like that bean, that's what Jonathan? It was, it was great. Yeah. We didn't have aphid pressure, and it was still my highest yielding bean. Hmm. 
Um, and then the one nine is the Viking 1955 AT. Yeah, you've had that one too and not liked it as much. Last year in Nebraska, I think I didn't have a real true test. And you've also felt like the one five had better uh, <coughs> The first number was uh, the 1-5, the Viking 1544 AT. And then the, the Iowa Safety is uh, Iowa 3027RA. That's the food, food type survey. Great questions. So you had a good question about the research and where you can find stuff. So this is our website, cryptofarmers.org. And if you go over here to our programs, field crops, horticulture, grazing, in those pages, I can't get onto them right now, uh, is our research at the bottom. So as we have new research reports uh, pop up, I mean, as we as I finally get to them and get them done, then we put them on the website. So this is an example of the one you have in your hand up. So they're all listed there. We have a lot of field crop research. We started in 1985 doing this, the farmers did. Um, this organization survived for 15 years without any sort of staff or directors. The farmers did research, got together, talked about it, and then and then rolled it up into these reports um, with really just one staffer. And all of that is there, and it's pretty amazing. So I really encourage you, if you want to go to the field crops, and then there's another button over here that says archives, go into that and then just search, you know, rich tillage or cultivation or organic versus non-organic soybeans, uh, transition to organic, because a lot of our field crop farmers transitioned to organic in the 90s, and so then they were documenting it, and it's up there. So we have quite a bit of information on it. Okay, so cover crops. <clears throat> How many people are planting cover crops? How many people are having any trouble with doing cover crops? Is it working pretty good? What's your what's going on that's maybe a problem? It's not raining. <laughs> that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What are you gonna say? It matters if you want to smoke. Um, no, you can smoke them up because it didn't rain in Iowa. It rained way more up here than it did in Iowa, and I have cover crops this tall. What were you going to say? Be special. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, I mean, it's not just me. Actually, just my question uh, putting a cover crop on ahead of organic corn in the spring uh, last year, we used oats, and I was speaking with another gentleman, and uh, he still thinks, recommends that oats would be a good idea, and I think that's true, but I'm wondering if I had some sand issues. So are you doing spring oats or fall oats? Uh, in this case, it'll be spring oats. So last, this year was, last year, 2012 was also spring oats. So you planted oats in like third week of March and then uh, terminated them in May and then planted corn? Exactly. Um, so you know that's a grass to a grass, right. which is your carbon to nitrogen ratio isn't in your benefit in that case. So yeah, getting a broadleaf in there would be much better. Um, I don't know what broadleaf could grow fast enough in the spring. It seems like with corn, you're going to have to manage nitrogen and deal with cover crops in the fall. So like this farmer here, he's in a two-year organic rotation, and we could get into the woes of two-year organic rotations or not. So he's corn, oats, then he harvests his oats and does a clipping, and then plants this, this mix, this five... Um, five species mix. And then in the spring, this is dead. So none of these things overwinter. It's winter pea, but it doesn't always overwinter for us in Iowa. Common vetch, common vetch, I don't know if that's gonna overwinter or not. Does anybody have experience with common vetch? It's, I, we don't think it winters here. It's dairy vegetable, but common vetch or American vetch. You don't think they're gonna overwinter? It's, it's not the cold thing. Yeah, crimson clover, I don't think it's gonna overwinter. Fava bean will not, and the radish won't. <clears throat> so he's going to put on normal his normal chicken litter next spring before he goes to corn. And I said, why don't you have three strips with reduced amounts of chicken litter? Because I think he's going to get a lot of nitrogen from this. I mean, you can really only see the, the radish and the turnips that are in this. But there was a lot of legume underneath there. Um, so he got this year, and this has been his rotation for four 
four or five years. This year he got 225 bushels on his organic corn. Yeah, no, it's not a Viking, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah, thanks a lot. Mm. <laughs> okay, you're expensive. <laughs> we can put it in the test. So um, my question is, when did he work this down? Did he work this in the fall or in the spring? Do you know, do you know that? So this picture was taken just a couple weeks ago. So this was planted August 9th. Right. And then this will die, and he'll work the ground in the spring. So he doesn't, and then work, corn. He doesn't work this mat, this green matter down in the fall. This just no, dies no. and decomposes. Right, right, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. There's a guy in Pennsylvania doing some work with what he's talking about, too, as far as clovers go. Uh huh. Like three way clover mix. One of them, Terry, Mitch, and a couple of other red clover. I don't know, some other stuff. He was here actually last year. Um, but he's actually broadcasting it on after the crop. It's probably in need of waste ice. Last time you can drive through the field. At last cultivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it's just amazing actually how it's actually coming up in the fall. You know, after you pick the corn and then he's filling it in in the spring. And I wanted to do some of that work myself this year, but with, I had injured my ankle and kind of lots of things didn't happen. So, planting, how many folks have tried the legume establishment at last cultivation? So last cultivation gets a little tricky because it gets really dry and any moisture you get at that time of the year goes to the cash crop, doesn't go to your cover crop. So keeping hairy vetch, getting it through two months, you know, until you, or three months until you get the crop off or get any sunlight into the canopy um, and that the cash crop is senescing so it's not taking up the moisture, any new rain you get, is a really long time. So, Ron Roseman has, did at last cultivation hairy vetch, red clover, and radish. And the red clover looked like this at corn harvest. The hairy vetch looked a little bit better, but not much better. And the radish wasn't even there. So I think June, July planting date of legumes and standing crops is too early. I, I don't, for the cost of the seed, right? And this is a picture of it flown on in the standing beans. Um, and this is radish versus and this, is, uh, this was planted in September, flown into standing beans, and then this was drilled after bean harvest in October, and these are pulled out of the ground December 1st. And this is radish versus rapeseed, and so you can just see the difference. So if you planted this, when you planted this in July, it wouldn't have gotten to the size to make it through, you know, until you're gonna harvest the soybean. Um, so I think flying on or at less cultivation is a little tricky just because of moisture. This worked okay, but you know, this seed's kind of expensive, so I, don't, I think this needs to be drilled, you know, like what we just saw, this picture. This is a really good stand, and it's worth $3 a pound of seed, because you're gonna get, there's huge tubers, I mean, they were like this big, I should have brought them in and we could have snacked on them, they were huge. So I think this is a good system before corn. I think this would give you a lot of nitrogen. Well, this is Right, this is August 9th. Right. Then that's where the aerial seeding is holding that nice coming into play. Right, absolutely. And if you're going to try to depend on nitrogen from a cover crop following soybeans before corn, you're fooling yourself. You're not going to get enough legume growth. Okay, I mean, this is the amount of legume growth. In, I, I hand seeded this in the standing soybeans. September 9th, this fall, this is the most legume growth I've ever seen. And that was this fall. The last three falls I hand seeded into standing soybeans, and the legumes are puny, and they look bad. But I was like, okay, we gotta get a legume for corn. You know, how are we gonna do this? So either we need to shorten up our soybean variety, shorten the shorter season soybean, so we can harvest earlier, so we could drill a nice mix of radish and legumes before corn, or we need to go to a, a true three-year rotation. You know, so that your legume before corn is oats plus red clover to corn. Yeah? This seed you keep mentioning here, is that the Austrian winter seed or is that? This is Austrian winter pea. I just didn't have space to put Austrian winter. And it doesn't winter at a Well, it just, I couldn't get it established overseeded very well. Which I think is common because these are these seeds need good soil to seed contact, so they need to really be drilled, I think, to get good. Yeah, these need to be at least an inch and a half in order to be happy. 
Yeah, I think this one only did good because I probably stepped on that seed. You know, because I'm walking through these little plots. You know, before I fly this onto the plane and spend a lot of money, I wanted to do it by hand. So we sent these seed packages out to 10 farms. Um, and several people have said, boy, the peas look okay, I can see them, but the hairy veg is a little bit strong. I mean, you can see it better. But to be a smaller seed, it probably got into the ground better. Yeah? What uh, you were speaking of conventional when you were talking two way rotation. What was that? You are talking conventional when you say these two rotations. Versus Organic three. farmers use corn, soybeans, corn, and a, and a third crop. I've seen it a bunch. It's not legal, though, is it? That's up to the certifier. So if you're going beans to corn and you want to try to get nitrogen for organics, you know, that's where you're not using probably a three-year rotation. So if you think you're going to get it from, from cover crops, I don't think it's going to happen. I think corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, and then oats with red clover. Where this farmer, the farmer that I showed this picture of, you know, he's in corn oats with this mix back to corn. So he's in a two-year, but his second year is not soybeans, so it's not so long. Yeah. Wouldn't that person be better off uh, plowing that under and taking the veg and treating the manure rather than just letting it die? Well, so if you plow it under this fall, you there's the an really What's that? Can you repeat the question? Oh, um, wouldn't he be better to plow this under this fall? So there's also a chance for loss of nitrogen, right? So if this uh, green manure, if this starts breaking, if this is tilled under and starts breaking down and then we get rain, there's there's a chance for nitrogen to be leaching. But if it stays intact and doesn't start breaking down and just freezes, then this is not turned in, this stays in an organic form long enough to avoid nitrogen leaching. So I think he's gonna lose less nitrogen and keep the soil covered, lose less soil, by keeping this on top of the soil surface. And any weed seeds that are on top of the soil surface don't get buried and then mice will eat them. So leaving the soil undisturbed in the fall is really a good idea for multiple, for lots of reasons. So in the spring, he's going to work this, but there's not going to be anything even out there. A lot of it, you know, there'll be holes, there'll be some residue, but it'll start to break down and it's going to stink really bad. And it's going to start to break down and then he'll turn it under and, you know, do primary tillage to prepare a seed bed. Um, so we're on, this is the Des Moines low, right? The Des Moines low. This is the, this is the low soils, okay. So these soils are heavier and usually we want to do full on fall tillage um, to help the freezing and thawing process in the Liebman study, which is what we talked about, the Leopold Center study, where the three year and four year have increased profits by adding oats and red clover. He tells every fall about that red clover because he, because of the heavy soil. So this farmer is a little bit west of here, and so his soils are the more naturally drained soils that are to the west of here, so it's a little easier for him to get away with this. So I could see maybe on the Des Moines Lobe how you would want to till because they're so heavy. But I just, I just, I know enough, I've seen enough farmers not till on the Des Moines Lobe in the fall and wait till the spring, and I think they're saving their organic, they're saving their soil. Because you get a lot of erosion, and your organic matter is concentrated at the top of the soil profile. You know, so like when you have like a 5% organic matter soil, that 95% of that 5% is in the top three inches, top four inches. So when you have erosion, you're not just eroding bad soil, you're eroding the best of the best, right? So you want to you keep things covered as much as possible to avoid erosion, which is the t-shirt, you know, don't farm naked. Don't have the soil be naked in the fall. Let me just show you this graph. So we lose, the majority, we have the, our soils are the most vulnerable in the fall when we have rain and snowfall, and in the spring when we have a lot of our rains. And these are the times when our soil is the most uncovered, right? So an organic farmer could, you know, have maybe an over, for going to soybeans, could have an overwintering rye cover crop, and then maybe drill into the rye cover crop, and then kill the rye cover crop um, with that lower crimper thing. Um, or, or, or mow it and then plant the soybeans. So you cover up going to soybeans, but before corn, we have to do tillage to kill that third crop, to kill the red clover, the alfalfa before we're going to corn. So we really have exposed soils in that system. So one out of four years isn't so bad, but like for a conventional farmer or an organic short rotation farmer, they're really exposed if they're doing fall and spring tillage. And so that's just an opportunity for soil to erode. Okay, this is what you're hoping for? 
the, I'm not talking about this graph yet, but the farmers who have been using cover crops in a two-year rotation in Iowa have been saying to me, you know, I saw 30 bushels difference in my corn yield in this drought year compared to a field where I know I haven't been using cover crops. So there's things, but soil organic matter is building or we're stopping erosion enough to really benefit and hold more water in a drought year. Okay, so I don't have the 2012 data, which would be really great to show because it probably, you know, because of the drought year. Um, but this is a 10 site study that we have. This is the farmers are planting winter rye every fall and then in the spring they're killing it, probably with glyphosate. And then these are not organic uh, farms. And then they're planting soybeans or corn and then we're measuring the yield every fall. And again, there's multiple data points in this one bar. And so I have the soybean yield, and then I have the uh, corn yield, and then one farmer's in a corn silage rotation. So in 2009 and 2011, we had no difference in soybean yield following winter rye cover crop. This farm, includes here, had an eight bushel increase in soybean yield following winter rye cover crop because he's non-GMO, and so he can't do a rescue uh, glyphosate treatment, so he needs the map of cover crop to control weeds, which is what we see when we have organic no-till uh, rye to soybeans. Is, has anybody tried the organic no-till rye to soybean combo? Really? So do, they, do you know what I mean? So you plant winter rye following corn, and then in the spring you let it go to boot stage, where it's starting to head out. Well, not, there's not a head yet. And you mow it, or you chop it, you know, any machine you have to mow it and chop it and put it on the ground. And then you no-till drill, or if you can, I think you could modify your plant to plant the soybeans right into that mulch. So you've got all this rye mulch that you lay on the ground and then you plant a legume into it. And that helps control your weeds through cultural methods. We should try it. Okay, so anyway, this farmer really sees a difference in that when it's not GMO, which would, which would be similar to the organic. Okay, and then in 2010, all farmers had a four bushel increase in soybean yield following which rye. We would expect this because it's a grass before a legume. Legumes like competition. Um, in the presence of nitrogen, legumes are lazy, so these soybeans probably nodulated more. Um, corn's a little bit of a different story, and in organics, this can be a much different story. In 2009, three out of four locations, no difference in corn yield following which rye. In 2011, no difference in corn yield following rye. In 2010, 12 bushel decrease in corn yield following winter rye, and then this Jefferson location, the herbicide didn't kill the cover crop at all, so this would be like your worst case scenario of rye before corn in an organic system where it's standing and heading out in a corn field, um, and you're trying to intercrop them. No sane person would try to do that. So um, the middle 2010 is more what we see one out of 10 years, or one out of eight years where there is a decrease in yield uh, where, where corn follows rye. And why does that make sense that we might have a yield decrease, corn following rye? Maybe a legal capacity, maybe carbon tie up, nitrogen tie up from all that carbon. It's a grass to a grass. Um, there's just lots of competition. Now I'm interested to see what, what's here in 2012 because these farms now have had rye in the same spot for four years. So do we get less uh, extremes when we have that cover crop consec in consecutive years? <coughs> and then corn silage, no difference in corn silage yield where it follows winter rye. Um, so just some other things we're trying. We really push farmers to aerial seed cover crops. Um, we have a cover crop business directory, which is a list of pilots um, and seed houses that can sell cover crops like Elderly Seed House. I can't find the director in a second. I'll find it in a second. Um, and a list of pilot seed houses and then maybe some custom applicators if you were conventional. And then we do see farmers modifying the tasslers or high boys so that they can get in. Uh, this is our high boy, which is pretty old. And we took this cedar off and now we have two 300 pound cedars. So it's just for demonstration. Uh, but some other people have been modifying the test, which are high. So you can get into that standing canopy, um, not at last cultivation, but more like September 1st time, when corn is a black layer or when soybeans are at first leaf yellowing. Like how we see here, this is maybe even a little too late. The leaves are maybe, this looks a little too early, it's too green. There needs to be at least a few yellow leaves. And this is a little too late because a lot of the field is yellow. And so you fly into the standing crop, 
and then with the soybeans, the leaves fall off and help mulch it into the soil, and any new moisture uh, stays uh, in the soil and helps get that cover crop started. So this is just the variety trial, which was the legume pictures I showed. If anyone wants to participate next year, uh, we don't we don't send cups of seed to you. We would send a little envelope of seed to you and ask you to participate in a trial if you're interested in testing out some new things. This is what we sent folks this year. Some of these things are for sale right here at the Seed House. Um, you can see a lot of legumes. We're trying a lot of legumes and then some winter barley and winter triticales. And we always pick cereal rye in there because it's the best performer. Uh, this is kind of what things look like. So I went out there. Um, it, this is a boon and did some above. So you can barely see some of these green things. I mean, here's hairy veg. Crimson color you can kind of see a little bit. Common veg looks better across the field than the hairy veg did. So common veg, maybe that's a new one that might work better. No, we just, we assess the above ground by putting a tape measure out with uh, marks every six inches to see what percentage of the plot is covered. So we can get an estimate of how much its performance was. And we'll do this in the fall and then we'll do it in the spring and see what overwintered. Um, so I think that's kind of it. So if you're interested in coming, and maybe we'll look at nodules on these legumes really quick. Um, if you're interested in uh, attending our conference this year, we're having Elaine Ingham from Rodale, who's a soil scientist there and, and started that 30-year um, conventional versus organic study. She's going to be our keynoter, and our focus this year is on soil which I happen to have some here from one of our variety trials. Maybe I'll have folks just pass these around and see if you can see any nodules. This is winter lentil. Does everybody know what a nodule looks like? Do you look at nodules on your legumes to make sure that there are nodules there? Who's going to go home and dig some up and do it? This is Harry Vetch. One of them. You get the prize if you find nodules. So we normally wouldn't see nodules at this time of the year, I, I think. Because um, the plant's just been established. I wasn't expecting to see any, but I did see some on the crimson clover. This is common veg. And then this also helps you just tell what the plant is. This is common veg. And then there's a pea that has the biggest nodule I've ever seen at this time of the year, right here. And it was pink earlier, but it's probably dead now. So, and I don't know if I have a crimson clover. So the crimson clover came with, uh, the inoculum was really well attached to it, sort of in like a clay, it looked like there was clay around it, and I think maybe that's why it nodulated it had nodules already compared to the other things we had to hand uh, inoculate. I don't know if you can see it on this one. I, I can tell them this one, so we kind of destroyed the plant. Okay, so um, just finally, if you're interested in trying the on farm research, we're here to help you do that. If you want to try any things with cover crops, um, or just come and be part of a group of farmers who want to try things out and really get into the devil in the details uh, at all our different events. Here's a copy of our conference brochure, the Soil, Soul and Soil themed conference that we're having this year. And I brought the Managing Cover Crop Profitably book. Uh, we sell this for $10. It's a reduced rate. It's a great book, resource, resource for cover crops. We sell, we sell it for $14.95. I'm sorry. It's $15. We buy it in bulk, so we break even. So I don't have very many copies, so I have to buy it from others. So what questions are there? Yeah. We had a question about uh, legume, following legume. Let's explain that a little bit. You well, so legumes in the presence of nitrogen are lazy, meaning they might not inoculate, they might not um, grow nodules very well, because they'll be using the nitrogen that's available in the soil first, instead of growing the nodules, which is for nitrogen fixation in the future. Um, so I just, I was just surprised that you would establish alfalfa after peas. 
Um, I don't have a ton of experience with that. That's just things I've read. Yeah. What about pizza? Oh, Sorry, what, let me, this, what, you finish and I'll repeat the question. Soybeans are after peas. Soybeans after peas. Same thing, right? Yeah. What were you going to say? If you flew it on, if you flew it on, you mean? So if if oats would actually grow well from being overseeded instead of drilled, um, it potentially could because oats grow up in the fall, um, where winter rye or winter any of the winter small grains put more of their energy into their roots and they grow soup, they grow up flat more. They're not standing up. So even if there was a lot of, even the growth that I saw out there, there is no problem with it. I mean, it wasn't in the head. Other thoughts? Yep. Crazy idea. What if you grew winter wheat in standing corn and then left it the next spring, or we can go there, but uh, the idea to harvest the winter wheat and then seed soybean in the lake? Any uh, experience with that? Um, it tends to not work too far in the arm because the wheat doesn't really need to work for the little bit. Yeah, so if you're following this, you, in this area at least, you, you don't have to do it. You normally have to do it. You can plant. You don't have to do it by the 4th of July. This year, it would be a good way to make sense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're not going to be able to be start with crops a lot better than just going like the Austrian winter. Yeah. Okay, well, I will leave some business cards here if you have any questions. 